Ten minutes. Like this. We're going to be starting shortly.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, we can start. All right. I'd like to welcome you all uh, this morning to the uh, commission ceremony for soon to be Lieutenant Ochibo. Uh, I am Chief of R. I'm a Navy recruiter. Uh, I would say it's been a pleasure working with him. He's uh, been an outstanding gentleman. Uh, not like he has a choice because he's a priest, right? <laughs> but, uh, but other than me being a priest, um, the, the report that I've heard from everyone who knows him has been very, very outstanding. And um, the Navy is very lucky to have him. I can say that for, for a fact. And I know the Chaplain Corps is lucky to have him as well. And I, I know, I know uh, Captain here can testify to that. All right, so uh, with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and start. So this is gonna be a covered event as announced earlier on. All my military folks in the house, please make sure you are wearing your cover. So with that being said, can we have the national anthem? It is our honor to present the United States National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red It's going to be the opening prayer, and this is going to be led by Father Tom Kiley. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Dear Father, I am grateful for the opportunity opportunity to join these officers, fellow clergy, and all of Father Emmanuel's families and friends in thanking us, thanking you for the gift of his life. We are looking forward to his commissioning, what it will do for him and what he will do for the Navy because of it. Father, under the protection of your umbrella, bless him in this new direction in his life that he is taking. Shine your light upon him as he goes out to do his best for you, for our country, and for the Navy. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Next, I'm gonna need uh, Lieutenant um, Brian Reedy to come explain the, exp um, the duties and call of being a chaplain officer. Please be seated.
vocati ad servitium, that is, called to serve. The history of the military chaplain arguably begins 1,700 years ago in the Roman Empire with a young man named Martin from a region of the empire known now as Hungary. Martin's father was a high-ranking officer in the Roman Imperial Cavalry. And Christianity had, not, had just been legalized in the empire, and although neither of his parents were Christian, at the age of 10, Martin responded to the call of the gospel and became a catechumen, studying to be baptized. At the age of 15, Martin was required to follow his father into the cavalry corps of the Roman army. And by the time that he was 18, Martin is believed to have served throughout Europe, eventually being selected to serve in Milan as part of the elite emperor's guard. And during this time, Martin encountered a beggar while he was on mission in what is now northern France. The beggar was poorly clothed and he was freezing to death in the frigid winter weather. Martin removed his military cloak and with his sword, he cut it in half. He gave half of his cloak to the beggar and redressed himself in the remnant. That night, Martin had a vision in which Christ appeared to him saying, Martin, a simple catechumen has clothed me with his own cloak. Martin was moved by the vision and understood it as a call to serve Christ in the church as a priest. However, his military career prevented him from receiving the necessary training. Two years after his baptism, he finally asked for permission to leave the Roman army to prepare for the priesthood. However, since there seemed to be an imminent war with the Germans, Martin was accused of cowardice by his commander. Martin responded by offering to stand before the enemy unarmed. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Martin pledged, and protected not by helmet and shield, but by the sign of the cross, I will thrust myself into the thickest squadrons of the enemy without fear. This display of faith and courage impressed his commander and his comrades. However, he was denied the opportunity to fulfill his pledge when the Germans sought peace, and Martin received his honorable discharge. Now free from the demands of his service, Martin could pursue his formation as a priest. He traveled to Tours, France, where he was ordained a priest and then bishop. He founded two monasteries while in France, both of which were destroyed in the French Revolution, which, at which time we also lost St. Martin's most famous relic. That is, the remnant of the cloak that he had divided with the freezing Christ. This remnant, stored at his monastery in Tours, was revered deeply by the Catholics of France, including the monarchs. We have records that major oaths were sworn on the holy relic for centuries. Additionally, the king of France, or a delegated general, would carry the little cloak, la capella, before them in war, invoking the, sa the saint's protection for soldiers. When furled, it was kept but in the king's priest's tent, and the cloth gave its name to the tent, which gave its name to the priest. That is, the capella gave its name to the tent, a chapel, giving its name to the priest, a chaplain. Thus, we bear the name chaplain in English from the cape 
of St. Martin of Tours. Fast-forwarding a few centuries, our story of the Navy chaplain picks back up with the foundation of the Royal Navy. Although warships were used by the English kings from the early medieval period, the modern Royal Navy traces its origins to 1546, when it was formally established by Henry VIII, making it the oldest of the United Kingdom's armed forces. And on this continent, even before the Revolutionary War, early American ships adopted many of the practices and traditions of the British Navy, including the staffing of larger ships with a chaplain and the use of a ship's bell for communication. And additionally, there was a custom in the Royal Navy that the ship's bell was used as a christening bowl for baptism. And once a baptism was complete, the child's name was inscribed in the bell. And indeed, many of the honorable ships of our fleet in the United States carry on this practice, and their ship's bells carry these holy inscriptions. The history of the United States Chaplain Corps itself and the Navy it serves dates back to the early months of the American Revolution. On 13 October 1775, the Continental Congress established the Continental Navy. The next month, on 10 November 1775, the Congress established the Marine Corps. And a few days later, on 28 November 1775, the Congress established regulations to govern the new Navy. Article 2 of these regulations directed captains of their ships to provide for religious services aboard their ships. This date is regarded as the birth date of the United States Chaplain Corps. On 28 October 1778, the first official Navy chaplain, Benjamin Balk, reported aboard the frigate named Boston. Already fully informed with the practices of the Royal Navy, chaplains were not granted rank or uniform, but only called chaplain, pastor, or parson, and dressed in clerical garb. Due to Chaplain Balk's honorable service in sea battle, he earned the nickname the Fightin' Parson. After independence was won from England, the Continental Navy was essentially dissolved Although the U.S. Constitution adopted in 1787 provided for a navy, because no ships were built for 13 years, the United States had no navy to speak of. However, piracy and international conflict compelled Congress to create the Department of the Navy on 30 April 1798 and construct warships for it. On 30 October 1799, Reverend William Buck son of the first Navy chaplain, Benjamin Bach, was commissioned as the first Navy chaplain under the new Department of the Navy and continued